Greetings and good morning to all of you this morning as we gather for worship. Uh, we welcome all of you who've braved the cold and the rain uh, to join us this morning. And we welcome those of you who are joining us from the warmth and the comfort of your home. Hopefully you're still in bed as you join us this morning. It is the fourth week in the season of Advent. It is the last Sunday before Christmas. Um, next week, Saturday, yes, it's all very strange. On Saturday, we'll be having our uh, Christmas Day service, and that will be at 8 a.m. So we do it earlier so that we can give you an opportunity to go home and to get your food ready and get yourselves ready for whatever uh, festivities that you've got uh, happening in the day. So um, that'll be on Saturday, the 25th of December at 8 a.m. We're asking that you would let us know now whether you are coming or intending to come to that service. Um, we are still with limited numbers and uh, we don't want to have to turn anybody away who's coming to celebrate Christmas. So we really, really want to know beforehand if you are planning on coming to that service. There are lists up on the notice board. Please indicate if you are planning on coming to that service. Then just a couple of things in the intimation apart from that service. Um, there are no birthdays this week. And there will also be no service um, on the 26th of December, the session decided that you, you would have had a jolly good time on Christmas Day, on the Saturday, that we won't be having a service on the 26th. So please don't come on the 26th because there'll be nobody here. Maybe Honest will be here. Um, and there, there won't be anything until uh, the next Sunday, which will be the 2nd of January. Then uh, there is... Uh, a box, I'm told, for a chalk that is somewhere. Is it somewhere? It's in, Louise's Louise's oh, in Louise's office. So um, they are collecting, as, as I understand it, uh, for people to donate into that box, uh, crocheted blankets, baby clothes, food items, or knitted teddies. And I presume, Lorraine, are you going to pop it through there when there are things in there? or? Yes, do it in the new year, so that gives you time to okay. fill it up. Put all your goodies, if you've got blankets and things like that, you're welcome. It. And then Lorraine will take it down, but we'll keep reminding you over the next few weeks. And then just to say that um, we were asking last week for all of you to bring your, pan your, your Christmas hamper for our pantries in. We've received a number of things. Thank you to all of you who have given us. If you'd still like to contribute and you brought it with you this morning, it's fine. We're making up the parcels tomorrow uh, to go out. And then just for faith, faith for Daily Living is available at the back of the church. Please collect your January, February edition, which is there because... Um, but the next time we meet, it'll be January. And then I think that's all from our side. Anybody got anything else that we need to talk about? No. I'm going to invite um, uh, Lorraine and Delbert to come and to do the lighting of our Advent candle this morning. The first Sunday of Advent, Advent, we lit the prophecy candle in our Advent wreath. It is also called the candle of hope. We light it again today as we remember Jesus, who was born Christ and King. And we remember that he will come again to fulfill all of God's promises to us. Second Sunday of Advent, we lit the Bethlehem candle, the candle of love. We light it again today as we remember that Christ, who was born in Bethlehem, has come as Saviour and Redeemer. The babe of Bethlehem has come out of love to bring redemption. Last Sunday we lit the third candle of Advent. It is the shepherd candle, the candle of joy. When the angel Gabriel told Mary that a special child would be born to her, she was filled with joy. 
She sang a song that began with the words, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit has rejoiced in God my Saviour. The fourth candle of Advent is the candle of peace, represented by the angel who proclaimed peace to the shepherds. Peace is a word that we hear a lot about. It is one of the things that we hope for. Christ brought peace when he first came to us, and he will bring everlasting peace when he comes again. We light the candle of peace to remind us that Jesus is the Prince of Peace and that through him peace is found. I mixed it up there. But the prophet Isaiah called Christ the Prince of Peace. When Jesus came, he taught people the importance of being peacemakers. And he said that those who make peace shall be called the children of God. Peace is like a light shining in a dark place. As we look at this candle, we celebrate the peace we find in Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Thank you, God, for the peace you give us. We ask that as we wait for all your promises to come true and for Christ to come again, that you would remain present with us. Help us today and every day to worship you, to hear your word and to do your will by sharing your peace with each other. We ask it in the name of the one who was born in Bethlehem. Amen. Amen.
Come, let us bow our heads as we offer up our prayers before the Lord. Let us pray. You will be with child and give birth to a son, and you are to name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. When does an ordinary life become extraordinary? A mundane day become revolutionary? A moment in time change history? When God enters in, forgives sin, allows us to begin again, when we repeat those words of Mary, where she says, May it be to me as you say. The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she, who was said to be barren, is in her sixth month. For nothing is impossible with God. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May it be to me as you have said. Lord God, you chose the very least and raised up us up to greatness. For nothing is impossible with God. You take the weak, the poor, and the blind, and you raise us out of the darkness, for nothing is impossible with God. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of gods. His love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord of lords. His love endures forever. Teach us obedience, O Lord, in every part of our lives, ears to hear your word, hands to do your work, feet to walk your path, a heart for all your people, a mouth to shout your praise, a childlike faith, humility, confidence that says to the possible and the impossible, I am the Lord's servant. May it be to me as you have said. For we ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Friends, our scripture reading today comes from the gospel according to St. Luke. And I'm going to be reading from Luke chapter 1, verse 39 through until the end of 55. In those days, Mary sent out, set out and went with haste to Judean town in the hill country, where she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the child leaped in her womb, and Mary was filled with the Holy Spirit and exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why has this happened to me, that the mother of my Lord comes to me? For as soon as I heard the sound of your greeting, the child in my womb leaped for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her by the Lord. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Saviour, for he has looked with favour on the loneliness of his servant. Surely from now on all generations will call me blessed, for the Mighty One has done great things for me, and holy is his name. His mercy is for those who fear him, from generation to generation, he has shown strength with his arm. 
He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy according to the promise he made to our ancestors, to Abraham and to his descendants forever. May God bless the hearing of his word to us this morning. And my sermon is not there. The picture that came across my Instagram feed was of two small toddlers. One was still in its nappy and the other one in a shorts and t-shirt. The picture captured the two with fistfuls of baking flour, sitting and standing respectively. The lounge suite and the carpet, all about them, was as white as snow. The younger of the two had a dummy in his mouth, but you could see the surprise in his eyes when he knew that they had been caught red-handed and that trouble was brewing. In 1868, Philip Brooke, a church rector, traveled to the Holy Land and saw Bethlehem at night from the hills of Palestine. He was in so inspired by what he saw that he returned to Philadelphia and asked his church organist, Louis Redner, to write a melody for the Sunday school choir to sing what we know as the Christmas carol, O Little Town of Bethlehem. Listen to the words. O little town of Bethlehem, how still we see thee lie above thy deep and dreamless sleep the silent stars go by yet in thy dark streets shineth the everlasting light the hopes and fears of all the years are met in thee tonight Earlier this week when I was sorting out this service and beginning to think about the Christmas Day service, I listened to this particular Christmas carol and I couldn't help but hear the second line, second last line of this hymn. And it kind of whirled around in my mind for hours afterward as I thought about it. The hopes and fears of all the years. They seemed to dance as I imagined these words well captured into the sentence. The hopes and fears of all the years. Sure, Christmas is filled with much hope. It is the one time of the year that even, I feel, if you don't believe in Christmas and the birth of Christ, you feel festive and you feel hopeful and you feel uh, ready to meet the new year. And maybe we fear a little bit. We fear a little bit. We fear things like what the year might hold for us. We fear what is to come. We fear things like death, illness, poverty, loss, grief. But do we fear 
the coming of God. Do we fear the coming of God? Should we fear the coming of God? Have we turned Christmas into a cattle lowing, no crying he makes baby Jesus silent night? When in actual fact, it should be something fearful. Dietrich Bonhoeffer writes in his Advent sermon that he preached in 1928 this. We have become so accustomed to the idea of divine love and of God's coming at Christmas that we no longer feel the shiver of fear that God's coming should arouse in us. The God of the world draws near to the people of our little earth and lays claim to us. The coming of God is truly not only glad tidings, but first of all, frightening news for everyone who has a conscience. Frightening news that the Almighty God, the creator of the universe, is about to enter our world. One commentator put it like this, God is coming, yes, as a baby in a manger, but God is also coming again in glory to judge the living and the dead, as the Nicene Creed puts it. Judge the living and the dead. Just like the toddler in that picture, we know we've messed up, that we've fallen short of the life that God has called us to live. Surely, surely we should even just be a little bit fearful about his coming. Today we read this rather unique encounter between Elizabeth and Mary. And I think it is worth pausing long and hard here to really take in all that is said and done. The words and actions that take place. A tradition that is seeped in patriarchy. A tradition that is seeped in patriarchy deviates to include a conversation between two women. That's a big deal. That's a big deal in our scriptures. And it's not just a conversation. It's a conversation about their pregnancies. And perhaps a conversation about how God has interrupted their lives to help him deliver the most important message of all time, salvation to the world. It's worth noting that both of these women are named. So often when we encounter women in the scriptures, they are nameless. We don't know their names. Elizabeth and Mary are named. And more than that, each of them are given a voice. They're allowed to speak. Their words are being recorded. And on top of that, they are prophesying both Elizabeth and Mary. We're told 
that the Holy Spirit came upon Elizabeth when the child in her womb leaped for joy. And she spoke these words to Mary. Prophetic words. And just as Elizabeth is finished with her prophecy, Mary begins a song, a prophetic song about God. Elizabeth immediately recognizes that God has not only blessed her in her old age, in her barrenness, and not just with any child, but with John the Baptist, who will be the forerunner to the Messiah. But she also recognizes through the Spirit that Mary has also been blessed and that she is in fact carrying the Son of God. Remember that Mary has only just had the encounter with the angel. A hop and a skip, not even the couple of verses just before we picked up our reading this morning. The angel has proclaimed to Mary that she is going to be the son of God. She's barely pregnant. She's just found out the news. And the scripture tells us that she goes with haste. She hurries and she goes and she finds her cousin Elizabeth in the hill country. She probably hasn't told anybody. She's probably still in shock. She's probably still trying to unpack all of these things in her mind. And she goes to Elizabeth. And Elizabeth confirms her experience that she is, in fact, carrying the Son of God. Perhaps along the way she thought, I'm delusional. This can't be, it was a dream, it was something else that was happening. It can't be possible. But when she arrives at Elizabeth, that is the first conversation that she says. I love the words that Elizabeth says to her when she says, And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her by the Lord. Blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment. There's something in Mary that believed that this was God. Mary responds with this song. And bearing in mind how long this conversation and this song are, there are verses and verses of it. The opportunity that Mary and Elizabeth have to occupy so much space in the scriptures is Nothing short of amazing. Mary responds with her song called the Magnificat, a word that is a Latin word that is taken from the very beginning as she starts, where she says, My soul, my being magnifies, Magnificat, the Lord. Mary announces the work of God in the world. In actual fact, she prophetically tells us what Jesus' mission will be when he is birthed and born and he begins his ministry. Those words that are found on the screen there. Listen to these words of Mary. His mercy is for those who fear him, fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things. And sent the rich away empty. That is the work of God. 
and it is and will be the work of her son, Jesus. It's worth noting that the verbs that are used in this particular section of Scripture are in the perfect tense. So for those of you English teachers or majors, you will know that a perfect tense verb implies an action in the past but is still continuing as we speak. So listen again to what Mary's actually saying. She said, God has shown strength with his arm and still does. God has scattered the proud and still does. God has brought down the powerful and still does. God has lifted up the lowly and still does. God has filled the hungry with good things and still does. God has sent the rich away empty and he still does. Surely, it is a little bit frightening to be the proud, the powerful, and the rich. From the prophecy of what Mary spoke about, both then and even now. Dietrich Bonhoeffer's Advent Sermon continues and he says, Only when we have felt the terror of the matter can we recognize the incomparable kindness. God comes into the very midst of evil and of death and judges the evil in us and in the world. And by judging us, God cleanses and sanctifies us, comes to us with grace and love. You see, I went off and looked up the word salvation on the internet. The definition of salvation, it read, it is the state of being saved or protected from harm or a dire situation. The dictionary seemed to describe and imply salvation as an ongoing activity, like that of being in the perfect tense found in Mary's song. We are constantly being saved. God has saved us and still does. The question is, why is Jesus coming into the world? Why is Jesus coming into the world and at Christmas? Because like naughty children, we've made a mess. And that should be frightening because we know we deserve to be punished. And yet, God chooses to forgive and save us. But, friends, if we rush past to get to the good ending where God just saves us, we miss the value of God's action and blessing that despite our sin, despite all that we've done wrong, He loves and forgives us. The Lord is near. God's coming as a babe in Bethlehem. God's coming again in glory to judge the living and the dead. 
is indeed a fearful prospect, but it is also good news. Because in Christ's mercy, he will finally burn away in us and in the world all that keeps us captive to sin and death. And that, my friends, is the good news of Christ coming into the world at Christmas. Amen. I'm in the business of challenging you this morning. And in that challenge, the next hymn we're going to sing, Angels from the Realms of Glory, has the beautiful music but has no singing, but has the words. So we're going to sing it as we did all those many years ago. So I'm relying on those of you who have strong and beautiful voices to lead us and to help us this morning. Friends, we come to that time in our service where we uh, participate in receiving and giving of the offering. Listen to these words as they call forth the offering. In this season of generosity, let us remember from whom all blessings flow. Let us present our tithes and our offerings to the Lord. Friends, we're so grateful for the support that you continue to give us during this time as you make those electronic payments into the bank account. If you would like to put uh, physical cash, you are welcome to do so in the plates on your way out. Come, let us pray. Holy God, with Mary we seek to magnify you in our worship and in our deeds. 
Accept these gifts and bless them for Christ's ministry. May they lift the lowly and fill the hungry. May they reveal your glory present with us today and still yet to come. For we ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Friends, the Lord calls us to pray for others, and especially at this time of Christmas, where people uh, feel more lonely and um, more uh, down and depressed because of those that they've lost, for those who are struggling with illness, when it should be a happy time. And so we take this opportunity to lift them up to the Lord. Come, let us pray. Come, O come, Emmanuel. Bring to peace, bring to peace to those at war with themselves, their families, their enemies. May those who govern do so with goodwill and justice, breaking down barriers, fostering understanding, and drawing our communities and our nations together in peace. Come, O oh come, Emmanuel. Come to bring comfort to those in pain, those who grieve, those in need of healing and restoration. May those who suffer be assured of your extravagant grace and comforted by the hope that nothing shall separate them from your love. Come, O oh come, Emmanuel. Come to bring compassion to those who are weak and weary. Those who stumble through the days unable to recognize the beauty and meaning of life. May those who are unemployed, those who are struggling financially, those who are suffering from the crushing weight of debt, find your way out of no way. Grant them options, God. Grant them hope. Come, O key of David, O radiant dawn, O root of Jesse, O Emmanuel. Come to us again this Christmas and fill the world with your grace and peace. Come, let us say together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Do not lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Friends, receive this blessing. The star, may the starlight guide your steps toward the place of wonder. May angels sing their news as you travel to the manger. May promise fill these days as we watch at the edge of the birth. And may faith tell you, Emmanuel will be with us soon in human skin. Thanks be to God. Amen.